All right, uh, David, do you want to check it off? Yeah. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We're uh, here with uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, who is uh, an American business leader and New York Times bestselling author. He's the founder of Strive, which is an Ohio-based asset management firm that competes with BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard. Uh, before that, he founded and led a successful biotech company called Royven Sciences, where he oversaw the development of new drugs that went on to become FDA-approved. Um, Bloomberg has called him a leading anti-ESG crusader, and the New Yorker dubbed him the CEO of Anti-Woke Inc. He's a graduate of Harvard and Yale Law School. He is the son of two immigrants. He's married to Apoorva, who is a throat surgeon, and he's the father of two sons, age three and one. So with that, Vivek, uh, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, it's good to be on, guys. I'm looking forward to... Uh more of a conversation than just a pre-scripted speech here. But David, can you hear me pretty well? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Yep. Sweet. And Elon, it's sure. good to good to finally meet you, man. I uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I look forward to meeting. Yeah, first. looking forward um, to this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's good. Oh. Uh, but uh, I mean, that, that was that was a great intro by by David, and I have to say I agree with all those <laughs> everything that was articulated. Um, and congratulations on everything uh, you, you you've achieved so far. And um, I think. Um, you know, I, I actually, I think people would just like to know more, you know, more about you. And, and um, yeah, I guess whatever you'd like to say. Yeah, uh, sounds good. We'll, we'll uh, yeah. kick this off. Most people have barely heard of me. And, uh, and this presidential race is, uh, is just getting warmed up. But, yeah, my parents came to this country 40 years ago with almost no money. And I've gone on to found multi-billion dollar companies. Not, not Elon Musk level yet. But uh, but nonetheless, companies that have you know impacted people's lives in a positive way, and I did it while getting married, following my faith in God, and bringing two sons into this world who we raise today. And I am genuinely worried that that American dream will not exist for my two sons and their generation unless we do something about it. I think for a long yeah. time we've been running from something, and the reason I entered this race. I did not expect to be running for president, but I saw a field, certainly on the Republican side, forming where I saw a lot of people who were running from something. I didn't see anybody who was running to something. And I think that's what we yeah, need to no, do. I, I think, if you, well, I think you've got a really po a sort of a point there in that, like, I think there's, this, there's actually sometimes quite a, a, a pessimism about the future. Um, and 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 with people like well, I think this to some degree like well, what should we do? Mm -hmm. Like, what is the good future? <laughs> you know, um, and um, you know, and, and obviously for those there's those those that are religious, and that's I certainly respect that. But then there's there's also like, you know, just if you're not necessarily religious, or um, even if you are, it's like it's like well, okay, what, what's the What's the point of existence? Yep. <laughs> you know, what, 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 what should we be doing and how would we know if it was better? <laughs> yeah, I, I think that these are the questions we should be asking. And I think we live in a moment, Elon, where like I'm speaking to you right as a member of my generation in some ways. I'm 37. I'm the first millennial okay. ever to run for U.S. president as a Republican. And, okay. and I think that the thing that's going on in our generation is that we are all so starved for purpose and meaning and identity. Yeah, I think that's and, true. and I think we're hungering to be part of something bigger than ourselves, and yet we haven't yet identified what that is. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and, 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 <laughs> you know it's, so, so I think some of this is beyond my pay grade, right? I think some of this is for pastors to take on the revival of God, the revival of faith in something truly higher sure. that is true. But I'm, I'm doing one small part of this. Okay, there's some small role yeah. for the revival of national identity too, right? Yeah. Answer what it means to be an American. That's something that sure. you ask people, you know, my age or younger, what does it mean to be an American? You get a deer in the headlights response. Like, whoa, what was that? <laughs> what did you just ask me? And I think if we fill even that vacuum of national identity with a clear answer to that question. That's what it means to be a citizen of this nation. And if it's a different nation, so be it. That nation has a clear answer to their question too, but I'm worried about this country. That fills part of that vacuum, that yeah. void. And that's what I think, that's, that's what I'm, that's what gets me going. <laughs> and I think that's part of the answer to the question. Yeah, I think we should, like we should always like aspire to be the good guys. 
you know? Mm-hmm. Well, what do you mean by that? Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. But yeah, I mean, just, you know, like, I, I kind of, I, I you know, grew up watching a lot of like, American movies and TVs and reading comics and whatnot. And, um, you know, I, I actually sort of, the, I, I, I like the, like, there was a morality to America that I think is actually quite good. Like, like this notion that there is actually good. Mm-hmm. There is not, it's not, it's, it's not just all relative, uh, you know, sort of a, a relative morality that there is good in the, good in the absolute. Um, and that, and that we, you know, we, we should try strive to be you know, a, a, a good civilization, a good, a good people that, you know, where we, we treat each other well and, uh, work hard and, and, you know, build great new things. And, um, that seems like, you know, what we should be, be trying to do and, 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 and just trying to understand more about the, the, the nature of the universe and like our place in it. And, you know, where are we today? Um, you know, like, that's why I'm like a big fan of expanding the, the, the scope and scale of humanity of, of expanding consciousness. Um, and, saying that civilization is a good thing, mm-hmm. not a bad thing. And, and, uh, it's, uh, you know, and really it's something we should further. Um, and, um, and, and ultimately, you know, be a multi-planet species, like a space bearing civilization, you know, and, and make true the things that we see, we've seen in science fiction that let that, but let that not always be fiction. Mm. Um, so, and yeah. see, Elon, I love that because I think that, you and I are, are in some ways on a similar mission, but going in in complementary but different directions, right? I think that there is such a thing as truth. There is such a thing as the good. And well, we, we should, uh, yes, I, I think I think if you say like this truth with acknowledged error, mm-hmm. like is, is is important. Which you know, to say like we think this is true might be wrong. It, you know, generally speaking, I think is is. But, but I think one can aspire to get closer to the truth. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's, what are the conditions that allow one to aspire to truth? I think that th- this platform we're having this conversation on, I think you <laughs> bought it at least with part of the aspiration of believing that the free exchange yeah. of ideas is part of the path Absolutely. that leads to truth. Definitely. And, you know, I think each of us is different and in, is interested in different spheres, right? I think part of your passion, it seems, is expanding to the frontiers of the universe beyond this earth, being, exploring, being the pioneers, the explorers, even on other planets. I, I look at... Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, yeah and and to, be to, to be totally clear, I, like, I, I, I for sure am a fan of like, hey, let's not mess this planet up, you know? Fair enough, um, fair enough. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's not like, you know, it's, it's, I'm like, hey, let's escape to another planet. <laughs> I'm like, let's just make sure things are cool on earth. But then like, hey, I, it'd be nice if, if like Star Trek and, and, you know, was real one day, yeah. you know, and... <laughs> <laughs> you know, like the cool science fiction. I think that'd be, and- I think that'd be phenomenal. And and I think that for me, my passion is all right. Leaving those two again, a higher pay grade than mine. But I think part of the truth we can rediscover. Part of what is good is the revival of things like individual self worth on this planet, a sense of yeah, grounding sure. in family, a sense of grounding in the nation. And I think that all of this, too, is yeah. even even long before we get to Mars or long before we get to another frontier, as I think would be great for expanding the frontier of human achievement and exploration, there's exploration within, right? I think we're like, yeah. you know, we, I, the analogy I sometimes use is we're like, uh, you know, we're like a bunch of blind bats flying around in a cave trying to figure okay. out where we are, right? <laughs> and, and that cave could be the universe and that cave could just be a okay. cave on this earth. But you know, we send out sonar signals and they bounce yeah. back and they say, hey, this is where I am because I'm blind. I can't really see where I am. And so what are those things that bounces off of? Could be family, could be my grounding the fact that I'm a citizen of this nation. That is true. That means something to me. Could be my faith that I believe in God, that, you know, sure. I'm, I'm a person of this faith. I'm an individual. I worked hard. I created something. Could be the company that I work for or that I created. That bounces back and yeah. tells me this is where I am. And so I think there's a lot of that to do at home. And I just think that, you know, our pursuits are in some ways complementary, Elon, but I think that we live in a moment where a lot of those other pillars right here at home on earth, even in the United States of America, even in central Iowa, where I am today, 
those pillars have disappeared. And I think part of what's okay. happening is we send out these sonar signals and then nothing comes back and we're lost. And that's where I think we are. And so my mission is to rebuild some of those basics. Okay. Well, I mean, I think uh, we should definitely not, not lose like pride in America. Like we should be proud to be American. And I, I certainly am. And, uh, you know, um, you know, there's, there's sometimes it feels like there's like quite a, a weird, like anti-American self-destructive element, especially in like the, uh, you know, elite circles within the U.S., which seems kind of crazy to me. Um, and at some of the colleges and high schools, they like, in a lot of cases, they're like teaching you it's bad to be an American. I'm like, this is insane. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like, it's not true. <laughs> well, in, in San Francisco, they ripped Abraham Lincoln's name off one of the high schools. This is insane. It's really crazy. You know, and there were other, <laughs> there were other examples where George Washington's statue is getting ripped down. Right. And, and I think this is just a symptom of, you know, we, we say we hate America, but it's really a form of self-hatred, even at the individual level, yeah. <laughs> right? I we agree. want to flog ourselves for success. It's the same mentality for why kids yeah. in school, a kid who graduates at the top of his class in high school in a, most public schools in this country has to hide his achievement because achievement isn't cool. Well, America is about achievement in many ways. And, and so America is not yeah. cool. So, so I think it's a symptom of the loss of self-worth. And it's not an easy thing to ask how we revive that, right? I think we observe the problem. And that part's in some ways easy to do. I think what we do to build up that self-confidence that we've lost, whether it's the self-confidence to start a small business or the self-confidence to set out to Mars, or at least the self-confidence to say, I'm a citizen of the nation founded on the most admirable ideals in human history, and I'm going to be proud of that. That ain't going to be easy. But I think that is the challenge that, you know, whoever leads this country, and I'm aiming to be that person next, I think in the next 20 years, if we don't get this right, I don't think we're going to have a country of the same kind that we will be talking about American exceptionalism anymore. And I think that will be not just a loss for the United States of America. I think that will be a loss for the world because part of America's role in the world is to provide an example of what is possible when you have a country founded on those ideals. And once you start apologizing for those ideals, I think that's going to be a permanent loss for history. And so... You know, I have thoughts on this. Maybe you have thoughts on this too, but identifying the problem, I think we're all seeing it with clear eyes. What we do about it, I think, is going to be a uh, is a tougher question, and I have my views on it, but, you know, Elon, maybe you do too. Yeah, I, yeah stop this nonsense immediately and, 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 and uh, castigate the educational system for teaching kids such nonsense. Um, you know, like what the hell is going on? And like the, the donors to to these universities uh, and uh, you know high schools and whatnot should be like rescinding their donations and saying, "What the hell are you guys doing?" Yeah, that's um, a start. You know, a big part of this is the the federal government. Stop sending. Federal yeah, government's a big problem those, too. Those, I mean, so, so you talk about those local yeah. schools. What what the heck are they doing? That comes from the U.S. Department of Education. So it's, it's a little bit invisible yeah. to a lot of people. It's not just the school boards that parents are happily now engaged in. The U.S. government says you don't get money from the federal government, which covers about 10 percent of public school budgets in this country, unless you adopt these toxic, self-hating, you know, racial and gender ideologies. But it's broader, broadly more of a national self-loathing ideology. And I think that, okay. like many things, this is solvable. So we're, basically pay, pay, we're paying people to hate America. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. And, and I think that's and solvable. That's, that piece of it's solvable. Of it <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is like we're just punching ourselves in the face here. <laughs> I suggest we stop punching ourselves in the face. You know, and, and, and this gets back to religion, Elon. You want to know why? Because you know, it's, it's like a self-flogging, right? It's like wearing a hair shirt, right? This is a, this is yeah. a sort of religious practice. People you know, engage in – this is an interesting feature of – exist in, in certain Christian tradition, exist in certain Hindu traditions, exist in basically every major tradition in the world is there's some sect that does engage in a sort form of self-flogging. And so I think what's happening here is we have a group of people in our country right now who are, again, hungry to be part of something bigger than themselves, have a hole the size of God in their heart and traditional religion or God doesn't fill it. They engage in a different kind of self-flogging instead. I believe, by the way, I believe yeah. that's much of what the climate cult internationally is all about, is 
a substitute for yeah, religion well, yeah. and self-flogging. But I think the same goes for American self-hatred. It's complicated. <laughs> I, mean, I don't completely disagree with the climate stuff. Um, we could go into that. You want to go into that a little bit? I think as an individual, I, I might have, as an individual, I, I think I might have done more to help with climate things than any, any other individual uh, by pretty, pretty big margin. And so sometimes people like will bizarrely think I'm like right wing or something. I'm like, uh, I've been like literally blood, put, pouring blood, sweat and tears next level into saving the environment. What are you talking about? This is so insane. Um, so I, 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 at least I perceive myself to be a moderate and I, and I, um, and I aspire to be a moderate and, and, and reasonable and, and, and not to take, and, and like just to, you know, care about our fellow humans and, uh, further civilization and, and, um, you know, I think part, if, like part of it also is that the United States has been the, on top for such a long time that there's a certain complacency that results when you've been winning for, like the United States really has been winning for so long. Yep. And it's like, a, it's like a pro sports team that has been winning for so long. You get a little complacent, yep. Yep. you know? Um, and, and that's, I think we should be wary of that. We should not be complacent. Um, and, and, uh, and, and you start thinking like there aren't any external enemies. It's just, just like with ancient Rome, if Rome didn't have an external enemy, they would have civil war. Yes. Um, and so in the absence of an, ex you know, if you just perceive, perceive yourself to be essentially invulnerable, then you, the, it become the internal conflict is, is a natural con consequence of that. Cause there are no external enemies. Well, look, I, I uh, think, but, the, but, I think... But in reality, there sort of are, or at least there are external competitors, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and, and we're obviously facing a huge, a, a huge transition that's ha that's that's happening in the world today is, is the obviously the rise of China and the fact that uh, the Chinese economy is gonna, probably going to be two to three times the size of the U.S. economy. This is really a big change um, because for as long as anyone's been alive, the United States has, has the biggest economy in the world. Um, but if, if if in the case of China, you simply said uh, assume a GDP per capita uh, efficiency relative to the U.S. of seventy percent. That would be roughly equivalent to a billion people in the U.S. or three times our current population. So the probability is like really, uh, China, China's going to we, we will be in in a, in, a, in a rather odd situation that no one actually can even remember where there is an, an economy twice our size. Yes, yeah, so I, um, <clears throat> I think that that's correct on the trajectories. I think there's a couple points in there, Elon, really important points that uh, that are actually encouraging for the United States. Oddly enough. What was your point about the fact that our success bred our entitlement, right? Success, yes, it's inevitable. It's inevitable. This is just history, right? Success yeah. breeds entitlement. Yes, yes. And it's normal. For, it's a human thing. It's a human thing. And, and, and then entitlement breeds laziness. And then, of course, vic victimhood yeah. culture follows because victimhood vindicates yeah. laziness. And you saw this in Rome, too. And so I, I appreciate the, the ancient Roman Empire analogy. Actually – my second book was all about exploring whether or not we are at the equivalent of the end of the Roman Empire. Yeah. And which we should be worried about. I think we should be talking way. about it. We should be talking about it. So, so yeah. I, I had took a dark turn during that book, uh, midway through Nation of Victims. And, and halfway through the book, I concluded that actually we should be so lucky as to be Rome because Rome lasted a couple <laughs> thousand years, yeah. right? If you include the second half. Sure. And, you know, yeah. we might be more like, Carthage, which only lasted a few hundred. Yeah, but I, I, well, actually, it depends. For a long, quite a long time, but, but definitely uh, got got short circuited there. With yes, it did. It did, <laughs> and, and 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 so and so I think that that was one version of it. But actually, my more my more careful study of it was that we talk about the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. It turns out yeah. there were many rises and many falls. Actually, yeah, sure. there was no one rise yeah. and one fall. And I kind of see the rise of this American experiment. The same way. I think there will be many rises and there will be many falls, but I don't think we're done with this ball game yet. I think we are still sure. can we still can be in our ascent. And so, just the yeah, arithmetic I, of it, Elon, yeah. you're right. If, if you extrapolate the existing GDP growth rate curves and linearly play them out on a compounding rate, it's exactly what you said in, for China in relation to the U.S. That is a big part of the reason why leading the country as U.S. president. One of the core things I've prioritized is actually making GDP growth a metric that we actually care about in this country. And sure. you know, in some ways, I'd rather measure economic prosperity than some other metric that we've chosen, you know, carbon emissions or whatever the metric of the day may be. Let's actually choose the one that better tracks the prosperity and, and might of our country over the next 50 years. 
And I think it's actually going to be more achievable than we've made it out to be. Well, I mean, we want to make sure that, that the United States remains a, a very much a meritocracy. Um, that that is a function of someone's skill and hard work that results in their success and, and that we do not have any sort of an entrenched, um, you know, uh, rich class effectively. Um, so but this is very important um, because otherwise it results in sort of ossification of society. Um, so we want to remain mer really merit focused. We want to obviously, um, I think, try to attract the people from around the world who are also merit focused and wish to join the country um, and we should make it much easier for them to join. Mm -hmm. um, I agree with that. I actually fully agree with that. And yeah. <clears throat> that's one of the things where I think the Republican Party needs to define where we actually stand. There is an anti-legal immigration current that, you know, which is which, which, I, which I'm going to be on the debate stage in a month. And this yeah. is going to be something that if anybody has uh, any any qualms with this, uh, you know, I think I'm going to have a real problem with that because. Merit-based immigration yeah. is one of the Super fixes important. to economic growth in this country. But yeah. Yeah. merit I, is the key, I, though. I, I, really, in, in fact, I, I think I, I, like, I want to say it in a way that I think people, that, that, like, the general, like, people, everyone can understand, which is, like, imagine, like, you're, you're, you're pro, like America's a pro sports team. We want to win the championship. We want to keep winning the championship. And there's some, there's some ace players on another team, and they really want to join our team. And now we can make them fight us or we can have them join our team and just crush. Mm -hmm. And I think just say, if ace players want to join our team, please do. <laughs> that is the way to continue success. Exactly. Um, and, and, and welcome them and not, and not have all these ridiculous obstacles. Well, and I think part of the reason you have that reaction is to play your analogy. Instead, what we have is somebody who doesn't even sign up for the team just gets to show up on the field. And that's what we have yeah. now, which creates a backlash from the existing team members to say we don't want any more. Sure. When, in fact, what we should be saying is we want the best ones who come and follow the process for actually training and joining the team. And that's what I think merit-based legal immigration ought to be about. But you know, I, I, I do think that this is achievable, right? I, I think that if you view it, even if you play the Roman analogy, right, just to think about this in the yeah. big arc of history, if you count the eastern half, it's 2,000 years. And – in yeah. that case, here's what I think is going on is, as a nation, we're not at the end of the Roman Empire. We're really just a little young, actually, going through yeah. our own version of adolescence, figuring out who we're going to be when we grow up. And, and then when you view it through that lens, Elon, it kind of takes the temperature down a little bit where, yes, we're going through this identity crisis. Yes, we're going through this national self-flogging, a self-loathing. The kind that most people, including me, certainly, did experience a little bit when going through adolescence. But you get to the other side of it stronger, if you actually get there, to our national adulthood. And so I'd like to think that's where we are, not in decline, but in our ascent. Maybe not even at base camp yet, on our way to the mountaintop. We should definitely take that attitude. I agree. That's like totally the right attitude to have. Like, I, I hate this. I just know this defeatist BS that's right. that they're teaching <laughs> yeah. kids that needs to stop. Um, that's why I'm saying, like, you know, funders should revoke funding from f f schools that teach this nonsense. And a lot of it is happening. Um, so that's people donors are unaware of. And they should just go, hey, hey, like, hey, go pay attention to what, where, what your money's doing. Um, and it's, it's doing some very foolish things. And uh, revoke funding, you know, if, if they keep teaching, uh, you know, Kids that America is somehow evil, which is insane. Well, it's, it's donors, um, Elon. It's school people, donors to schools. It's also, frankly, people who don't know this. I know you know this, but many people don't. Is their own retirement accounts are causing corporate America to adopt the same philosophy yeah. too, right? Voting for yeah, you think, know, equity audits yeah. at a corporate board is in some ways a manifestation yeah. of that same philosophy. And what we don't know is yeah. our own money is being, able, is being used to do it, be it taxpayer money or 401k money. And so some of this is easily that, solvable. That's exactly what's happening. Yes, I mean, th there's a fundamental uh, governance issue uh, that you've hi highlighted here where uh, because uh, you know, I think it's roughly half the stock market are passive uh, or index funds, um, meaning they're just following, you know, uh, an index or something. Um, and these will be at Fidelity, BlackRock, T-Row, all the normal sort of, you know, re retirement places. Right. Um, 
but but when but but those votes are then outsourced to usually one of two organizations um mm-hmm. institutional shareholder services um who i sometimes call the isis um, <laughs> it's about um, you know it's about the right right use case i always wondered what the difference was between isil and isil and isis now i know which one's isis that's good yeah. Yes, it's quick. sometimes they behave like corporate ISIS, yeah. um, and then there's Gla- Glass yeah. Lewis. Those are, those are the two main ones. There are a few others, um, but if, effectively, um, when the you know when half the stock market is out, are outsourcing the uh, voting decisions to a, what amount to a handful of activists uh, or people who certainly have an agenda uh, at uh, these uh, at Glass Lewis and ISS. Um, you've, you've essentially got a handful of people voting half of the public stock market. And Elon, you, you were aware of my last company before running for president or, or uh, you know, you, you strive. I mean, this was my whole premise, right? Taking this on. Okay. So I started it. I mean, my, my bigger company that I founded is a biotech company. I got a, you know, a bunch of medicines that are FDA approved. But this is a different this is a different adventure. Uh, last year, last August, and actually our you know mutual friend Peter was one of the one of the backers of the company to help get it off the ground, but was an index fund provider actually, which created index okay. funds where the premise of the index funds was that you actually vote according to whatever maximizes value by providing yeah. excellent products yeah. and services by literally not saying that there's, you're going to divest from certain companies or invest in others. Many people play that game, but to say, no, no it's the same passive exposure Oh, and then by the way, there's a separate arm of it that does proxy voting on behalf of people who don't want to be stuck yeah. with the duopoly. And so I, I believe right. all else equal, I want to see the government stay out of this as minimally as they can to solve these problems. This should be solved through the market. People gravitated to it, yeah. you know, got, you know, got, got well, off the ground pretty quickly, I, but it's, it's going to yeah. require seeing these complicated challenges, which are different than the you know, classical threats to liberty or culture that we saw half a century ago. Yeah, well, I think like fundamentally here, the public is, is being misled mm-hmm. and, 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 and they, they don't realize they're being misled in that they've, they've given um, their savings to these you know, 401k plans and these index funds. Um, and that's, that's what really constitutes half the market. And they're on the assumption that the, vote, that, that the way that those shares will be voted is, is in the shareholder interest that will maximize their ultimate return and, and you know, have, have the best sort of retirement uh, savings and that kind of thing. But actually, that is not what is occurring. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, the votes are, are in, in many cases, contrary to the shareholders' interests. Oh, they're directly contrary the to them. So, so I'll give you two funny examples. Yeah. Is but the public, the public doesn't know this. It's, it's totally this invisible. Is, it a huge to the it's totally invisible. Yeah. So, so, I mean, this has been – I've tried my best. I wrote two books in the last you know, couple of years about it. But you reach – it's their technical subjects. And the thing I've realized is it yeah. is designed to be technical for a reason. And that says a lot about <laughs> – why we see technocratic abbreviations like ESG. It sounds boring. You know, CBDC, yeah. whatever it is, it's designed to sound boring for a reason is we want to make it difficult for people to see the way in which their own investment accounts, say, are weaponized against their own best interests. On that particular case, Elon, this is probably, I think I'm an antitrust skeptic mostly, but if you believe in antitrust yeah. law, this is arguably the largest antitrust violation in human history of the same three firms being the largest shareholders of major competitors and of each other at the same time using their votes in a coordinated dogma as a signatory of the same social commitments because the same pension funds are interested in them or invested in them. But the real question is, yeah, no, I, I, I think all all those like, you know, BlackRock, Fidelity, T. Rowe all need to be like, Hey, look, uh, the votes are going to be to to maximize shareholder value, not for some, uh, you know, random sort of work or other agenda that the, the these outsourced shareholder services companies are promoting, which is, is, is that that's that basically what I'm saying is like, you know, Tiro, Black, BlackRock, Fidelity, they're breaking the deal. That's right. With the, with their customers. They are. Okay. They're breaking the deal because the deal is the, and if you, is the deal is maximize shareholder value. The deal is not, Go make a bunch of social changes. That's right. And, and you know what they say now, of course. So I, I always believe in getting the best arguments for the other side on the table. So they'll say, no, 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 you don't understand. This is maximizing value. It's about long run value rather than short run value. And we understand that more diverse yeah, teams, BS. of course, it's BS. We got to cut through it. 
And, and, <laughs> yeah. and so the funniest thing is like, take Apple, right? Your, your friend, Tim over there is, uh, sure, you know, sure, so, so, sure. so Apple, uh, so there's this proposal. This is a funny story, actually. So there's a group that puts up this proposal for a racial equity audit at Apple. Okay. okay? It's like, it's like they own like, they're like two shares and it's like nonprofit group. And so Apple's board, yeah. of course, rather sensibly says, hell no, we, meritocracy is part of what our hiring philosophy is for our engineering talent. So no thank you to the racial equity audit. And then what happens is though that random proposal, guess who votes for it? BlackRock votes for it. State Street votes for it. A bunch of other financial institutions vote for it. So many yeah. that it gets over 50% shareholder support. But then Apple, yeah. to avoid embarrassment, the board says, oh, no, no, just kidding, guys. You know, this is about long run value maximization. So then now if somebody new shows up at the table, right, you know, so Strive, say the firm I've founded, right, the, the experience that, that we had was you'll then show up at the very company that even two years before was saying hell no to this nonsense because they've been forced to bend the knee and been chastened and in their sense and experience of it publicly shamed by it, then if somebody says, no, 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 mm -hmm. why don't we just undo that very thing you didn't want to adopt? What they say is, no, 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 no. This is now about, they've been almost with the ardence of the converted. This is about long run yeah. value maximization, perpetuating that culture of self flogging. Well, and so that's, that's where the frontier of the yeah. ESG debate is right now is behind this farce well, of long runism, which is really just, you know, really just that it's a farce, but we have to be able to cut through it with reality it, it's, it's false yeah. it, it's false yeah and and obviously i'm very pro-environment you know it's hard to get more pro-environment than me um but but like we we just don't, don't like we, we don't want basically some sort of like bizarre like communism rebranded thing which is like a lot of what esg is mm -hmm. um and uh to be inflicted upon corporate america without the knowledge of the actual shareholders which is what's going on and and so the, I, the, I'm saying the public is being lied to by their really they're being lied to. They're um, and I'm naming names here because I know and BlackRock, Fidelity, Tiro, and I know you guys. Yep. And and you need to tell your customers that you're not making the optimal decisions for shareholder value because that's what's going on. And this is part of what the difference was and between it's not cool. and, and you know the U.S. and Europe over the last fifty years. I'm not saying this was the sole difference. But I think it was a factor, Elon, where U.S. stocks over like a 50-year period have outperformed European stocks. And the fundamental model yeah. of corporate governance in the U.S. was value maximization. The fundamental model of corporate governance in Europe was the multi-stakeholder model. I think our side yeah. won. Why on earth now, to play your yeah. basketball team analogy, would the basketball team adopt yeah. the strategy of the losing team to adopt that as its own if it's playing the next quarter of the game? That's exactly what we're yeah. doing. Which, which I think yeah. is a problem. I'll, say, I'll, say, I'll actually say one other thing about this ESG thing is that I think the the, 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 the big the big firms, the Tiro, BlackRock, you know, Va, you know, Vanguard, all of them, they're like uh, they're, they're setting themselves up for the, the the biggest class action lawsuit in the history of class action lawsuits by an order of magnitude. Yes, because if, if, if they because they're 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 not they're not uh, they're breaking the deal with with their their customers and they're not maximizing shareholder value. Well, you know who's really setting uh, themselves up for the for the lawsuits, Elon, is the, the problem is it's not even the people who are giving them the money aren't even giving them their own money, right? Those are either pension funds or they are intermediaries like investment advisors across the country, right? They're like the local guy that hung a shingle at Raymond James or wherever. They're the ones sending yeah. somebody else's money. And so BlackRock and Vanguard, their excuse is, well, we now disclose all of this stuff to clients and they're still sending us the money. Well, that client, the problem with that was not himself the owner of capital. And so actually the wave of lawsuits is first going to probably come to the Black Rocks and Vanguards and, and State Streets of the world. They're going to kick it upstream and say, no, 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 we disclosed it and our clients still sent the money. But their clients were themselves money managers for other people. That's what happens when you have sure. an industry that's so intermediated that there's so many layers to the waterfall. That's actually ripe for, for corruption. But the deeper point, that you mentioned is, and it has far implications far beyond just the ESG question is we're being lied to. I think you said yes. it again. And I think that gets to the heart of the moment where <laughs> it's like the movie, right? The average investor is being misled. The, the average that's, investor that's, is being misled. Elon, let's, let's, let's be yeah. real. The average citizen is being misled by the government sure. yeah, in the same way that yeah. the average investor is being misled by the leaders of the woke industrial complex or, or asset management firms or whatever yeah, you want to call exactly. it. Exactly. And, and it comes down to, yeah. you, know, you ever watch that movie, uh, <laughs> A Few Good Men? It's, you know, it's, it's comes yeah, down sure. to the question of, you know, the Jack Nicholson character, right? 
we can handle the truth, actually. And I think uh-huh. that is the moment we're in as Americans. We can handle the truth of where a virus came from yeah. or whether masks work or whether vaccines have yeah. side effects or whether a Hunter Biden laptop yeah. story was real or whether you're using oh, my man. money. Right? <laughs> we can yeah. handle the truth. And that's the moment we yeah. live in. And, and, and that's the American. I mean, that was the American Revolution, actually, because the old world vision was that we, the people, could not handle the truth. We could not be trusted. It had to be a small group of people in the back of palace halls that made the decisions for the rest of society at large. But on this side of the pond in 1776, we said that, you know what? No, we reject that. Sometimes we might get it wrong. Sometimes we might get it right. But for better or worse, we the people decide how we govern ourselves. That was what the American Revolution was about. And, and unlike yeah. you, Elon, I'm not a moderate. Actually, I don't like those labels. I don't. I don't. I don't, I don't <laughs> use those labels. But I'm in because the American sure. ideals are kind of extreme, actually. Right? Free free speech. I don't think you're a moderate either. But but <laughs> I don't think that I don't think that I don't view this as a partisan exercise. I'm, my whole point is the American sure. ideals are themselves rather extreme ideals. Right? <laughs> free speech, self governance, the fact that we the people can handle the truth. That's extreme for most of human history. It was done the other way for most of human history. But that extreme set of ideals, that is what unites us. That is what makes us American. That is what makes us great. That is what makes America itself. And in some ways, I think that's actually how I think we're more likely, Elon, to get to national unity in this country is actually not by necessarily saying we're going to you know, compromise at the 50 yard line, hold hands and sing Kumbaya and compromise. I actually think it is by being in some measure uncompromising about the ideals that unite us. And yes, those are extreme ideals, but, but that's cool. That's America. That's us. And, And I think that's the moment we live in is do we want incremental reform, which a lot of politicians are claiming to offer, including in this race that I'm running in a Republican primary or in some sense, do you want the American Revolution, the ideals of the American Revolution? And I, yeah. I stand on the side of the American Revolution, and I think that's actually our last best chance of uniting and rediscovering who we are, and we should be proud of it. I agree. So it's, um, it's, it's important to not fall into the trap of thinking that all these solutions are going to come from government. Right. I mean, the things you're doing, working on on a given day. Yeah. Right. What you're doing with X right now. <laughs> I, I mean, generally speaking, I think we want the government percentage of the economy to be smaller rather than larger, uh, just because the, 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 the government is, is really a corporation in the limit. Um, that, so sometimes people think a government is different from a corporation, but it's really just the government is a corporation in the limit. It is the most corporation corporation. Um, and it's, it's got a monopoly on violence. Yep. And so you have to like say, um, OK. Uh, how much do you want a giant monopoly on violence to do? Um, yep. <laughs> you know, not that much, less, uh, generally, mm-hmm. not more. Um, and, um, you know, we, we, we've you know, shown over and over again that um, the power of free enterprise and, comp- and competition, we do need to make sure that there's good competition in, in these markets. Competition, uh, you know, makes companies honest and, and makes them work harder to serve their customers, which is, that's what, you know, makes people happy mm-hmm. and makes for a better world. Um, you know, look, if you, you wouldn't want to have just like one car company, you know, no. or one airline, no. um, you know, you want, you want them to compete and, and, um, you know, and, and that, that's what makes things better and, and have that across the board. So whenever something moves, moves to, to the government, the important, like, if then it's like saying, okay, now we've now got rid of competition and, and it, the, the feedback loop for improvement is, is very small. And, and, um, you know, so the, the same person in government or in, in, in private industry, they're going to be is far more productive in private industry. Um, yep. So we, we just want to make sure our, our personnel allocation is towards that which is most productive, yields the best standard of living for the people. And I'm, by the way, I'm totally down to take questions. I'm actually a very bad co-host of a – this is actually the first spaces that I have been a host of. So this is actually okay. – actually, uh, I don't know how to take it, but if you if, well, if you guys, you or Sachs, want to take questions, yeah, you know, go for it. So well, I've just been trying to stay out of it. And, like, <laughs> talk. Um, well, we had a good one, Sachs, on all in. I like that. Yeah, and, and actually, right. we didn't. We 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 left off on Ukraine last when you and I spoke. But well, uh, I'm happy of, to go wherever you guys want. Yeah, and by the way, everyone should check out the the last pod that we did, the the all in pod. Um, 
we we did two hours with Vivek uh, about a week and a half ago. So um, everyone should check that out. But speaking of truths the public can't handle, I'm seeing on Twitter reported by Michael Tracy and Glenn Greenwald retweeted him that um, the Senate just voted down having an accountant for Ukraine. You know, they call him the <laughs> inspector general. Uh, Why? That's basically a fancy Why? term for an account. Exactly. We can uh, handle the truth. We can handle the truth that our money was siphoned to play a bunch of Ukrainian corrupt people, including the including the government bills. A lot of people, Elon, in terms of our money, not knowing how yeah. our money is being used. Here's another one. People in the U.S. don't know this, but our taxpayer money is literally paying the salaries of the people who work for the Ukrainian government. And if okay. we're going to do it, let's at least see it, right? Let's at least yeah. be able to account for it and see the That's dollars. Our, yeah, but we should, I, I mean, should, yeah, I mean, like I, I think I'm, I believe in supporting Ukraine, but we're just, we, yeah, we, we want to know that the money is actually going to help. So why, Ukraine. why, Elon? And, and Can I ask you it's, that? It's not. We, we want, just want to make sure. Are, are we enriching some a handful of oligarchs, or are we yep. actually helping the people of Ukraine? And and we just need to make sure it's, we're actually helping the people of Ukraine as much as possible. I think I, I, I wouldn't even set sail as like some impossible standard for like no, no corruption, because I think we have some corruption even in the US. Um, so it can't be like no corruption. But let's just like say like, you know, what percentage is going to like a warlord versus the people, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and the, the people should get most of it. <laughs> Well, well, speaking of warlords, though, and, and I and I would love to hear your perspective, Elon, which I you know respect, but I, I haven't heard it on this issue, on why you think it's important for us to be there. I, you talk about the word warlords. I think the way this is going to end, and possibly like in the next 12 months, is it's not going to end well for Ukraine. All that money we poured in is much of it in the form of military equipment that's going to end up in the hand of some post-Zelensky warlord. And then we have exactly a repetition of exactly what we did when we armed the Mujahideen after the USSR invaded Afghanistan. We've seen this movie time and again, and I'm a little bit worried that, among other reasons why I, I personally do not come down on the side of support, the U.S. supporting Ukraine, which we can go into, as a practical matter, I think that is where we're currently on track to head, is about $200 billion of military equipment ending up in somebody's hands who we have no idea who that really is. And we're only going to find out after the fact, like we have so many times in the last 50 years of failed interventionist strategy. But I'm right. actually open-mindedly well, curious what your perspective is on this. Well, yeah, can, can I, I just can I, sure. can I just remind, yeah. the, remind everyone that Elon posted a poll on Ukraine. I think this was in September of last year, yes. about nine months ago. And exactly. it was basically a poll, a, a peace proposal which proposed um, peace on the following terms. It was roughly that Ukraine would remain neutral, which is to say it wouldn't join NATO or any other military alliance. And the territories of Crimea and Donbass would be decided by the right of self-determination, basically to hold free and fair elections, arbitrated yeah, internationally by... internationally supervised. Internationally supervised. Exactly. Yeah. So the people of those territories would decide. And then assuming... Crimea went with Russia because historically it always has been Russian and um, you know, it's 80 to 90% Russian that that, that their water rights would be secured. So they didn't, you know, they didn't um, die of famine or something. And that was basically the peace proposal. And it was massively shouted down on Twitter, including by no less a person than Zelensky himself, who said that this was a pro Russian proposal and anyone proposing peace really over the last year has been, pretty much shouted down and called the worst names, called an appeaser, um, you know, called, uh, you know, a Putin puppet and all sorts of things like that. When really we just wanted to figure out a amicable or a reasonable compromise to the situation. And, you know, about 60% of the people voted against um, the, the peace proposal. But now if you look at the situation, what we're getting is not better. It's much worse. Um, yeah, it's going mm-hmm. to get worse from here, not better. Exactly. The, 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 the reason I, pro- I put that for that proposal was for the benefit of Ukraine, mm-hmm. not for the benefit of Russia. Uh, that, you know, uh, so it's, it's like, uh, I want to be clear, I'm on Ukraine's side here big time. Um, and I've demonstrated that with you know, actions, you know, with the massive support that Starlink has provided, which the Ukrainian government has been acknowledged many times. Um, frankly, it was instrumental in, um, you know, in the war. So 
See, Elon, um, this is a fun one, actually, uh, probably because the three of us have kind of complementary perspectives here. I'm on America's side on this because well, I'm running to be the U.S. president, but I'm not I'm not sure that the cut and dry Ukraine side of this versus Russia side of this is as clean as we make it out to be in the sense that you know, there's a lot of history here in the Donbass region and there's a lot of history for you know, NATO saying that we would not expand. This is James Baker, the U.S. Secretary of State's commitment to Gorbachev in 1991, that we would not expand one inch. That was the famous not one inch commitment beyond Germany. And yet here we are now even not only admitting more nations to NATO after the fall of the USSR than we ever did during the USSR, but now even entertaining the possibility of Ukraine joining NATO, which was the one hard commitment that Putin required, or at least appeared to demand prior to his decision to actually pull the trigger and invade Ukraine. And so I I guess I'd be curious, Elon, like, why why are you on the side of Ukraine? Yeah, well, first of all, let me just um, make it clear that uh, I, 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 you know, when I look at a subject, I'll often get like just OCD on it and go like just to insane levels of detail to understand exactly what is going on at a precise level and minimize the error of my understanding of and the, I, so I, I actually read almost the entire history of uh, the, the region. Um, so, you know, starting from, you know, Oleg, uh, who, you know, seized Kiev in 1882 and, and essentially formed the beginning of Kiev and Rus. Um, and that goes on and on from there. Um, you know, and, and, and the, I think it was Catherine the Great in like 1893, uh, tried to force all of Ukraine to speak Russian. There's like, there's, there's so much, there's so much back and forth. Like the, the grudge list is so long that, mm-hmm. that, that if it, it, you, it would take hours to just even summarize the grudge list. So the, the, the thing is that people in Ukraine and in and at Russia can find a million reasons to hate the other side. Um, if you if just look at the history. So, uh, this is why, you know, the Christian principle of turn the other cheek is a very wise one, because if you do not ultimately forgive your enemy, you're, you're, you're stuck in a cycle of retribution forever. Um, and so you, you, even though your enemy, you're, they, they may have done bad, really bad things, if you just if you keep wanting to get revenge back and back, back and forth and back and forth, you know, an eye for an eye, eventually everyone's blind. So. That, that's why there has to be forgiveness uh, and there has to be some, some realism. And we need to also look at Ukraine and, and, and Russia not as Russia is pure devil and Ukraine is pure angel. This is, there are no angels in war. Mm-hmm. Neither side, it, there, there have been terrible things done by both sides, of course. Uh, now, on, 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 on balance, I think obviously the, you know, uh, I still I support, support Ukraine. Um, but, but I think there's, there's uh, you know, if, if we, we have to be realistic about what's going forward. And, 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 we, and we, you know, as we speak, the flower of Ukrainian youth is dying in trenches. Mm-hmm. So there mm-hmm. better be a damn good reason for that. It actually needs to matter. Why are these boys dying? For what? And, and that's a good question we haven't ourselves answered and to the point about forgiveness, Elon, and I thought it was actually beautifully just said about the endless list of, of grievances. It's very complicated and depends on where you start the plot and where you end the plot, depending on what you see, is the U.S. So the thing that bothers the heck out of me is that I think it was in April of the first year of the war, in April of 2022, Zelensky was ready to come to the table for peace negotiations. And Boris Johnson, because he was facing his own, you know, party gate thing, appeared to want to deflect attention from that and shows up. And then the U.S. convinces Zelensky to fight on by saying, no, 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 we're going to arm you. And I think that was actually the real mistake, because I don't think that Putin's goal so much is to conquer Ukraine. He's not even going after Kiev, right? He's much more focused on Kharkiv and and the Donbass region. And so I think we've made this worse, is my concern, actually, relative to the two nations just working it out against amongst themselves. Yes, and, the, the, the thing is, like, as, as you progress uh, further westward, the, the, the local support for Russia drops exponentially. Um, so obviously for Ukrainian speakers, they're generally going to be very anti, you know, anti-Russian. But, but I think most of the Russian speakers will, are actually pro-Russian. And it's hard to believe that when you read American media. Um, yes. 
So, and, and it's, it's also, it's not true that all Russians are evil. This is false. We should stop, and, and we should, you know, and, and we, should, it, it, we should be also sad that, that, the, that there are Russian boys dying in those trenches, not just that there are Ukrainian boys, because do they want to actually be there either? Why, why are these young men dying? Because of disagreements among old men. Mm -hmm. Why? And, 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 and there's just in, in entrenched warfare where only a few miles are exchanged. What, at what price? Uh, how many lives per mile ultimately mm -hmm. is it worth? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that the reality is for, for the U.S. I mean, Russia has more of a national interest at stake here than the U.S. does. China is also coming to Russia's aid that there's no version of this that is, you know, I'm not looking at this from a view from nowhere. I'm looking at this from a U.S. view because that's the hat I wear here is from a U.S. view. There's no way this is going to end well. And I do no, think that, that that's, that's sort of getting to peace quickly and ending and uh, reaching a peaceable resolution where we make, among other things, a hard commitment that NATO will not admit Ukraine to NATO is absolutely a must and an imperative. And, and the weirdest thing, you know, Sachs, you and I were talking about this, is this is the one bipartisan consensus, right? We talk about actually a time of deep national division between Republicans and Democrats in the United States. This is one where Biden in his ranks and, you know, most of the GOP, save for me and maybe one or two, you know, you know Tucker, maybe one or two other people, he's not, we're barely part of the GOP at all have actually a defecting view from what is otherwise the single greatest bipartisan consensus that we have in the United States, which is to pour more money into a war where we do not have an identifiable national interest at stake. And, you know, I think this, one of the things about studying history, and I, I appreciate, Elon, that you talked about the fact that you bothered to study the history. It's a good example for other people is you realize that this story doesn't end well, even if you study the recent history of the United States. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I think in the, in the Ukraine situation, um, we, there needs to be a realistic peace negotiation, um, and the sooner the better. That's, and that that is that is what we should be pushing uh, uh, from the West to do is is uh, come up with a, something sensible, um, and and stop sending boys to die in the trenches. Um, and, and don't and don't blow up the Nord Stream pipeline, and maybe even as part of this. It would be a good idea to get Nord Stream 1 and 2 operational again, and that sure. having restored economic relations between Western Europe and Russia can actually be a good thing rather than yeah. a bad thing by pushing Russia into a corner with yeah, China. And, I, and I, I think one of the things we learned is, um, Vivek, you referenced the Istanbul Agreement, which Boris Johnson did basically travel to Kiev to shoot down. Um, those details came out subsequently. And the substance of that Istanbul agreement was very similar to the peace proposal that Elon floated in that mm -hmm. Twitter poll. Again, it was based on neutrality for Ukraine plus self-determination for the people in those eastern regions uh, of Ukraine. And so they could have had that deal. I mean, that deal was on the table and the West rejected it because, frankly, the military industrial complex is hell bent on NATO expansion. It has been our central policy, like you mentioned, going back to the 90s when we broke our pledge to Gorbachev not to expand NATO, that NATO expansion is absolutely the policy of the U.S. and the West. And they are hell-bent on, on this expansion. And that is why we have rejected every proposal, both before the war and after the start of the war. I mean, this was known. This is one of the biggest areas of media gaslighting, really, since covid is this idea that this war has nothing to do with NATO expansion. In every conversation, diplomatic conversation that we've had with the Russians, this has been the central issue for them, is that they do not want what they regard as a hostile military alliance directly on their most vulnerable border with troops, weapons, bases, biolabs, nuclear weapons even, you name it. That is completely unacceptable to them. That is a red line for them. They said it many, many times. And our own diplomats including the current head of the CIA, Bill Burns, said it. So it's not just the Russians saying it. Our experts said for many years that our, our desire, our crusade really, to expand NATO right to Russia's borders would eventually result in hostilities with Russia. And that is what has brought us to this day. And we are 
on the brink of continually escalating this into something that could turn into World War III. So, Vivek, I do applaud you for saying explicitly that we need to stop this crusade of NATO expansion and recognize that the path to peace here is for Ukraine to be neutral. And, you know, there are precious few presidential candidates saying it. You're saying it. Uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is saying it. Um, I think you guys might be the only two. I think that's it. That's yeah. it. That's the whole ballgame. So I, I really applaud you for that. And we have to stop the gaslighting on this subject. This was known. It was said by experts for decades. And now we're pretending like NATO has nothing to do with this conflict. It really does. And you just saw that at Vilnius again. So, you know, we need to get the truth out there that that is a major component of the the root of this this conflict and this war. And therefore, it's going to be an essential component to the solution. And we're never going to have peace without it. it it's there's an interesting deeper uh, line to connect, because I think this relates to a, a separate issue here that we all three of us care about, certainly is free speech in this country. And it's not just the threats to free speech from the government. And, you know, I loved the Twitter files. And by the way, Elon, I have said that when I'm in the White House or if I, you know, fortunately get there in a year and a half or whatever, we'll do the state action files, which yeah. is the other side of this, which is yeah. any time a government official has pressured any company, not just Twitter, any company in the last five years, at least, we will yeah. publish it, at least for the public to see. Yeah. But, but, but it's not just the governmental censorship. It's sort of this cultural censorship on Ukraine. When, when I say the things that, Sachs just said, right, which is literally talking about NATO expansionism. I mean, what are our objectives here to expand NATO in violation of prior commitments we made? The, the feel that I get, right, just 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 the, you know, the ethos of it, it feels a lot like when those of us who said it said that the virus likely originated in a lab in Wuhan yeah. in mid 2020. There's something about it that it's sort of beyond the pale to accept. And I think one of the things we've learned in the last few years is, you know, at least the muscle memory of that is, is useful, <laughs> which is anytime you sort of feel a cultural closing of ranks around you saying something that's grounded in reason and fact, what Sachs just mentioned, grounded in history, you know, a lab origina a virus originating in a place where they do research, gain of function research on exactly that very place where a global pandemic originates. It just sort of feels right. Sounds about right. But then you feel the cultural forces around you telling you that, no, 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 you got to shut up, sit down and, and go back to doing as you're told. I think that's those are actually some of the most important questions for us to actually double and triple click on and actually get to the bottom of it. And in some ways, you know, there's many issues around the world that the U.S. Yeah. I think has, has views on. But that's part of what's drawn me to this issue even yeah. more is the cultural closing of ranks on this question. Yeah, I think this also just there's people somewhat overestimate how much ground Russia can take if there's not without support of the local population. So in the, in the case of Donbass and Crimea, there was significant support from the local population. So they were able to make significant progress. This is obviously not true yep. of Western Ukraine. Um, and if you look at say the Winter War, uh, where Stalin, who, you know, who's a hard driving personality to say the least, um, you know, tried to invade Finland and failed. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> yep. like when you have severe resistance from the, the, the local population and basically everyone's against you, the entire population is the army. Mm -hmm. So then, then you're like, oh, we've got a 300,000 person army. Well, they've got a 2 million person army because the entire population is opposed to it. Um, you will not make progress in that situation. This notion that Russia can just steamroll in, in these countries is false. That's right. Yeah. Uh, or that they would have a desire to. I mean, take Poland, who, yeah. unlike the rest of NATO, actually pays for their own defense. There's no reason why Russia would have to go after Poland if we've actually reached a peace treaty that's backstopped by interests of the U.S. And so, you know, I do think that uh, I, I do think it's, you know, Zelensky, I, I think, is betraying, I think, Ukraine's long run interests based frankly, on the short run I here. Only Frank, I think so. It's gone to his head. You know, uh, you know, he's, he's been faded too many times. Like if you keep telling someone they're awesome 17 times a day, it's, it's you know, it's gone to his head, to be totally frank. Um, like, so, uh, you know, it, and, and, it, and we're, so we're going to stop that. And we're going to say, like, look, your people are dying. You know, it's, it's, it, as you point out, it's not the long it's really not a long term smart thing. 
those people, those, those kids are never coming back, you know? So, yeah. uh, and, and that we're dying for a mile of territory. Like, this is insane. Um, you know, here's something funny on this is, uh, I, I haven't shared this story broadly before, but you know, there's actually a weird, uh, and, and I think promising and encouraging alliance hiding in plain sight between those on the so-called far right and those on the so-called far left on this issue, actually. So, you know, many people on the, on the, you know, anti-Iraq far left, I mean, folks like Bernie Sanders, I, I believe, I haven't heard him say as much as I would like, but I think do agree with folks like myself who otherwise disagree on a lot else. And so, you know, actually just a few weeks ago, I, uh, I was coming out of an event and it occurred to me I couldn't find a single Republican and even many moderate Democrats to agree with me on this topic. And so I actually gave Bernie a call and thought we could actually, you know, talk it out. But um, I think he thought it was a prank call. And so he, he was he, he uh, you know, didn't didn't want to actually discuss it. Let's just say to put it mildly is the way the conversation went. But I hope I get to talk to him another time because it's actually <laughs> It's actually an interesting way that we can reshuffle and redraw the boundaries where one positive silver lining coming out of, I think, the reaching of reason on the question of Ukraine is that we do not live in a single axis to pole political partisan divide in the United States of America. It is artificial. It is made up. And much of what we're trying to retrofit into that, right, the struggle between the managerial class and the citizen, the, even the questions of foreign policy about which priorities the U.S. should and should not actually risk our military equipment or our young men and women to defend. These do not track traditional Republican and Democrat boundaries. And I think that that also, in the, in the sense of taking a step back, that should actually be hopeful for us as a country. If we have the courage to actually step back and see it's not about black versus white or red versus blue, if we're able to actually have a reasoned debate in the open about what are, I think, the most difficult questions of our time. And so I am personally hopeful that that is one of the side effects, so one of the net positive side effects to come out of our yet-to-be-had open debate as a country on what actually we should do in Ukraine is that it calls the bluff on the otherwise artificial retrofitted model of right versus left, Republican versus Democrat, which I think in large measure doesn't exist. It's antiquated. And, you know, hopefully this is one of those issues that helps us smoke that out. So, Sax, we already went, went through the hour. Do you want to take up questions or do you want to uh, – we, we can rock and roll and do this again another time too. I'm down to I got another uh, well, half yeah, hour. There's folks out there. Um, I'm good to the bottom of the hour. Yeah. yeah okay, great. Well, let's see. Um, I know Richard Hanani has got a book on Woke coming out. It's called The Origins of Woke. And um, – Richard, you have a question on? In that yeah, area? sure. Uh, hey, David. Uh, hey, Vivek. Uh, both of you guys, I appreciate you guys are both uh, <laughs> blurb on the blurbs on the, giving me blurbs on the book. Um, and hey, hey, Elon, it's nice to you know, it's nice to talk to you, um, Vivek. Man, I've been so impressed with you. I mean, we we've, we've been talking, you know, from before you ran, and when you you know said you were going to run, I was you know skeptical as someone who's. Uh, knows a little bit of political science, knows a little bit about the history. Uh, not that I didn't think you had a great personality and potentially a great message, um, but it's just, it's always a long shot. I mean, the president, you know, you weren't, you know, you weren't, you weren't on training wheels. You weren't starting out with something, you know, something easy. You were going straight for the big job. And you've, you've impressed me. I mean, the message is, you know, the, the positive sort of culture war message, um, the, you know, the idea that there's not just a culture war, but there's like some kind of excellence we could be moving towards. It's really hit with people. And I just want to say, you know, you've been, you know, you've really, really impressed me and I'm glad to see what's been going on. Um, and thank as you, far man. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thank you. Uh, thank you also for saying, you know, mentioning how poor Europe is relative to the U.S. I think that's a point that doesn't get made uh, often enough. You just give people the numbers uh, on Twitter and they don't like it very much. But I like, you know, I like the fact that you just, you know, you're putting it out there that, yeah, we, um, you know, this experiment has been tried. The big government, you know, 50 percent of GDP government spending, uh, large tax rates, uh uh, uh, large la labor regulations. Um, those are a problem. They, they've tried it and it hasn't worked. So for all our problems, I'll take uh, the U.S. Uh, any day. Um, and I appreciate the Ukraine discussion. I just wanted to ask about, you know, my, uh, the, you've, you've talked about the civil rights law and you've talked about sort of the, uh, the importance of getting back to merit. Um, you know, we've talked about uh, like the executive order 11246 um, and the, uh, uh, the government uh, 
uh, affirmative action and uh, government contracting. And I just wanted to know if you've uh, sort of fleshed out these ideas to any great extent. Um, once you do get into office, it's not it's not too early to start talking about these things. Sort of what do you see as sort of the uh, uh, the main uh, the main um, uh, initiatives to take on civil rights? What offices are you looking at? I mean, have you started thinking about personnel, any kind of thing like that? Um, I just want to know how your thoughts have developed over time on this. Yeah, well, first of all, man, your book has been uh, instrumental in affecting my thinking and even the articles you wrote leading up to it. And, you know, I think you're able to expand the Overton window on this, right? I think you're, you're in many ways cracking that open further on issues that were previously untouchable, like even the undesired or unintended effects of Civil Rights Acts of 1964, I think that that's actually something that we ought to be able to talk about in the open. So Uh let me just tell you the simplest thing on day one, and that'll give you a sense for how I think. You referred to Executive Order 11246. Most people outside of, you know, nerdy civil rights law scholars or students like you and I uh, won't know. It is an executive order that Lyndon Johnson signed. It didn't go through Congress. The U.S. president just sort of penned it into action that said that if you do business with the U.S. government – Today, that includes about 20% of the U.S. workforce that you have to adopt quota systems for race, gender, and other metrics. Every president since Lyndon Johnson could have taken a pen and crossed it out. Actually, Nixon, a Republican president, made it worse, went in the yeah. other direction as part of his battle against unions, which, which is, I think, an untold part of the story, too. This is a bipartisan problem. What I've said is I would take a pen and cross it out on day one. I do believe in such a thing as colorblind meritocracy in the U.S. I do believe in the dream that no matter who you are or where your parents came from or what your skin color is, you should be judged not on the color of your skin, but on the content of your character and your contributions and rewarded accordingly. Absolutely. And so much of what I see is, is, is uh, you know, a violation of rights law. And we'll, we'll, you know, just like the Harvard case that came out is one tailwind, we'll use the law to make sure that we do restore colorblind meritocracy in the country. Are you, Sorry, uh, you know, are I was you, saying something there. I just wanted to follow that. But they, I mean, do you, what do you think about, you know, the Civil Rights Act is sort of a sac- sacrosanct, right? I like to frame it as civil rights law, but I, you know, I understand that there's going to be, uh, you know, there's going to be difficulties here. Uh, how confident are you that you could take that message and, you know, you could sell it? Because I don't, I don't think it's going to be easy, even though I do think it's worth doing and it's doable. Well, I'm going to sell it. And whether I succeed or not depends on the responses of people of this country. But my whole premise is I'd rather speak truth and lose the election than to win by playing some political snakes and ladders. So far, it's been working. It got me from zero to you know third in the polls yeah, or whatever we are you're now. Nip- you're nipping on DeSantis' heels, man. I, I've seen the, <laughs> seen the polls. It's pretty But we'll see. I'm not, I'm not attached to a particular result. I, I'm attached to the truth. And my view is Look, I actually pushed – I might as well just share this with people. I pushed Trump's people on this, right? I asked them why they didn't just take a pen and cross it out. And what they said is that was a political hill they didn't want to die on. (laughs) And and, and my view is if you're grounded in principle and you're grounded in moral foundations and first principles, not vengeance or grievance or animus towards anyone, but really just grounded in first principles, then you should not have to worry about what the political fallout is. And people tend to follow leaders rather than people who are afraid of the people they're leading. And, you know, my bet is, Richard, I think we're going to be successful. I think a lot of the jurisprudence of so-called hostile work environment lawsuits, somehow non-discrimination on the basis of race or gender became interpreted to say you can't create a hostile work environment, which means you say things that people disagree with or else you're violating the civil rights laws. No, I don't think that's the way it was supposed to work. Uh, you know, I say this tongue in cheek as a Hindu, uh, but as, as an expression, there are no sacred cows here for me. Uh, you know, not when it comes to the U.S. laws, at least. I think we have to go to the heart of the heart of the matter. And I do think that there were many unintended consequences where even if the people who voted for the Civil Rights Acts then knew that they were being applied the way they are today, I think they'd be shuddering. And I think we have to at least Probably. take that history into account. Exactly. We're- we're- Yes. Um, we're, we're actually violating the spirit of those who put the, the, the laws yeah. in. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, there's, a, there's a great story. I mean, in the book, I, I go over this a little bit about the original intent of the Civil Rights Act. I mean, they put a they put a um, they put a provision right in there. They were worried about disparate impact. They were worried, oh, what if somebody has a test and somebody does better than someone else? Um, you know, one race does better than the other. Is that going to be illegal? It came up because in Illinois they had a kind of a version of the Civil Rights Act, and they went after Motorola for this. And they actually put a provision into the Civil Rights Act specifically so this would not happen. The New York Times editorialized against disparate impact. Everyone thought that this was a ridiculous concept there's the you can look at the uh some of the senators who voted on the bill uh said things like um you know you could still have uh if whites have more education than blacks and your workforce is all whites you could set the standard as high as you want it doesn't matter um as long as you know you're hiring by merit i mean the historical record is absolutely clear you look at those court cases that have ruled on this they basically ignored that uh, historical record they've tor- torn it up we've got a good we've got a good uh supreme court now that's willing to uh you know move us it move us in a better direction on these matters uh so yeah you're absolutely right i mean the history here is crystal clear and in the legal specifics to one side i mean not to be I try to i try not to get too angry about this stuff because i want to just stay focused on what we're running to you know it's interesting even america right the word not a lot of people know this it was you know it's i i used to i, I was on a quest to say it doesn't have anything to do with merit <laughs> it sounds like it merit america and it turns out merit comes from a Latin root and America comes from, you know, Amerigo Vespucci, who was named after his grandfather, whose name was Amalric. Okay. Amalric is an old Gothic word. Uh, Rick means master and Amal means work. Okay. So it's like sort of the master of work. That is almost okay, America's well, that's, heritage. That's kind of cool. Our namesake. Yeah. Actually, I wasn't aware of that. I actually literally own etymology.com and I wasn't aware of that etymology. So you I, own <laughs> etymology.com. Yeah. Wow. Well, would you be willing to sell it, Elon? I don't know. We can. Um, we can... Yeah. If, if somebody wants to really go hardcore on etymology, yes. <laughs> yeah. no, that's good. But anyway, it's, it's, it's a good reminder that that's who we are as Americans. Get ahead through hard work, colorblind meritocracy. Yeah. It's exactly. who we are. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let me try. So I've just been calling on people who I recognize who have interesting, you know, X accounts. So. Uh, why don't we go to Amid next, and then we'll hear from Mario, Ian, ALX, and Nick. Yeah, thanks, okay. guys. Thanks, David. Thanks, Alon, uh, for doing this again. Awesome stuff. Vec, how you been, man? Good to talk to you. Hey, good, man. Um, so just one thing you mentioned on hoping that Democrats are anti-war. Uh, that ship has sailed. Don't forget that the Congressional Progressive Caucus withdrew their letter asking for diplomacy. Uh, that's how co-opted Sanders and his ilk are. But the one thing I wanted to ask you about was um, FTX, largest Ponzi scheme in U.S. history. Uh, you probably aren't surprised that its ESG score was higher than ExxonMobil. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Sam Bankman fried donated over $100 million to Democratic-linked ca- uh, causes. And yesterday, the Department of Justice announced that it was uh, withdrawing all campaign finance-related charges against him. Um, what will you do uh, as president to address the weaponization uh, of the Department of Justice to stop things like this uh, and the fiasco that is Hunter Biden uh, from happening ever again. Well, well I, I do think, Amid, that, you know, what good is an insurance policy if it doesn't uh, pay out? You know, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> so so uh, the problem with SBF's problem is going to be he didn't buy the Cadillac plan because I think he he actually committed some like ungodly sum of money he was going to give and that he only gave a fraction of it. And so I think they're going to ultimately make sure that he gets punished for not buying the full Cadillac policy, uh, because had he bought the full Cadillac policy, he'd already be off the hook. But for the partial policy, it paid out to let go of the campaign finance charges. Uh, so, yeah, obviously cynical and only and only half joking here. But the, the real so, so I actually want to take this chance to go into a proposal I've made that a lot of people view as extreme. But then the more you learn about it, the less extreme it actually is. It's actually very practical, All which right. is I think we need to shut down the FBI. Actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> like, take the FBI. So, so stay with me for a sec. Stay, stay with me okay. for a sec. Okay. And All Elon, right. you, you're a reader, right? So I'm going to recommend a book to you. It, okay. My wife's my wife's a faster reader than me. She's sure. ahead of me on it. But it's called G Man. It's a Pulitzer Prize winning okay. book. It's about the history of this institution and J Edgar Hoover and yeah. the way in which the institution was built. And it's fascinating. But yeah, the, the, it had issues. It had issues. Yeah. 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 <laughs> he had some issues. It's still the J. Edgar Hoover building of the FBI. So it's still an institution that celebrates his legacy. But as a practical matter, right, at the local level, you have local police and you've got local prosecutors. You don't have this separate giant bureaucratic morass sitting in between. 
Okay. Well, it turns out at the federal level, you have institutions like the U.S. Marshals, which have, I think, by and large, I have no evidence to suggest there's been corrupted at all. They carry, they bust up child sex trafficking rings. They've done a lot of good work. Yeah. You got the DEA on the drug okay. cases, financial crimes enforcement network in the Treasury. So if you take that FBI, right, there's 35,000 people who work there. 20,000 of them are in back office functions, but are really have taken on a policy making role, right? It's not like they're enforcing the law. They're kind of deciding what the policy ought to be. I'm going to send them packing and they got to find honest work in the private sector or, or, or whatever they'd like to do, but it's not going to be working for the taxpayer. But the 15,000 people who are actually on the front lines will move them to the U.S. Marshals, to the DEA and so on. Okay. And then you actually have drained the lifeblood out of a bureaucracy where, to bring it back to Omid's question, where a lot of the original sin in the weaponization of government in these cases, not just today, I mean, dating back to threatening Martin Luther King with suicide, blackmailing him, it, it's an institution that was built when you have a redundant bureaucracy. It's almost like a law of physics. Okay. A, a redundant bureaucracy is a formula for corruption. So, so you know, um, it's I, less I, extreme I, than it sounds. Yeah, I mean, I... <laughs> And just, just by the way, for the record, I, I, I've met a lot of people at, at the CIA and, and FBI, and, and they've all been really high integrity people. I just want to be, you know, like I'm, I'm not saying that there aren't some bad apples in any organization, but man, I, I, I really, I've not, I've not really met a bad person. Uh, and I think and, the fifteen thousand. I mean, so, so when I say shut it down, that doesn't mean that that everyone's a bad person. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. mean any of them are a bad person. It's something yeah. about the nature of a redundant bureaucracy. Where, like Elon, I think what one thing that's happened is specialization, right? We, we, when people are specialized, they tend to be more effective. When they become generalists, maybe less so, at least in government, I think. And yeah. those 15,000, if we move them to their specialized functions, you know, I think that actually becomes a more practical way of effectuating the laws rather than the sort of armchair yeah, I mean, manner I, I, they I mean, do today. You're, you're, you're saying basically that, that, that all the bases are covered by other organizations, and right. so we distribute the personnel to those organizations rather than have the redundancy uh, that, that exists today. But, but you're confident that if we did so, that there would not be gaps uh, in, 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 you know, in, in important crimes that need to be dealt with. And not only would there not be gaps, we would actually uh, be more effective. That's what you're saying. I, I, <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. That, I'm, I'm, I'm just phrasing, is that, is that what you're saying? Yes, yes. Okay, yes. okay yeah. that, That's okay. exactly right. Okay. Yeah, the fact, okay. Uh, I want to go back, um, David, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll ask my question, and, and good to see you again. Go, go for it. Good to see you again, Vivek. Appreciate the invite. Um, you said something when we were talking about the Ukraine war, about the U.S. made the war worse, and, and you know we've had discussions in previous spaces about the establishment or the military-industrial complex. I'm relatively naive, less naive after what I saw happen in Ukraine, but if you do become president, is there anything you can do? Because it does seem systemic to me. And, and how big of a risk is it when it comes to the tensions with China, which you've been uh, pretty concerned about? Yeah, so look, I think that the managerial class at the Pentagon, it's time to go. I think that this is a antiquated group where, you know, kind of like the analogy we just had about the FBI, most people, I haven't met somebody who has served or serves currently in the U.S. military that isn't in it whose heart is in it for the right reasons. Yeah, but I think and that's just the, it's just the truth, yeah, yeah. right? Anybody, any of us, 1.3 million of them. Yeah. But there's the managerial class at the Pentagon where they haven't offered a clear statement of mission and purpose. And so when you have a vacuum of mission and purpose, right? I, I think the purpose of the U.S. military should be to deter wars and win wars in order of priority, deter wars being most important and then win them when we get into them. And most importantly, prioritize protecting the lives of Americans on American soil. With that clear mission statement, we could measure up what we have done in Iraq or now in Ukraine, which I think is destined to be in Iraq or a Vietnam all over again, if we keep going in the current direction. That's part of what we need is a restoration of purpose. And so it's not that these are bad people as individuals, but when an institution continues to exist without a purpose then the institution finds new things to do that outlive its purpose. And that itself creates a form of corruption that maybe no one individual is actually responsible for, but was just a nature, a feature of the beast itself. 
And so one of the things I would say is that's a tiny fraction of the people who serve in the U.S. military that actually work in the Pentagon. But I'm going to, you know, largely be cleaning house there and bringing in, you know, a new form of talent, really flushing the toilet on the neocon sort of dogma that I think pervades much of the Pentagon today. And to come back to, let's just say, get some Cold War realists in there, you know, the George Kennans, the James Bakers. That doesn't really exist in today's foreign policy establishment or military establishment. And those would be the kinds of talents. And by the way, we are working on identifying the kinds of talents we're going to staff the top layers of every part of the federal government with. But that would give you a flavor of the kinds of people I would put as a new sort of leadership at the Pentagon. And the job of the commander in chief, that'd be my job if I'm elected, is to offer a clear statement of mission and purpose of what the U.S. military is even supposed to be concerned about, which for me is protecting American lives, foremost on American soil, deter wars, and when necessary, win wars, and that's it. And whether you care about what we're doing in Ukraine or the rise of wokeism in the military, these are symptoms of that deeper loss of purpose, in my view. Yeah. You're here. Agreed. Yeah, I think one of Trump's biggest mistakes was hiring all these neocons. I don't really get it, because his instincts were to keep us out of wars. In fact, he did keep us out of wars, new wars. And, um, you know, I think he had more realist and non-interventionist instincts, but yet he appointed all these people like Bolton and Pompeo and on and on who want to get us involved in all these, you know, new conflicts. Um, maybe there wasn't, you know, maybe the foreign policy establishment is just so rife with groupthink, um, sort of neocon groupthink that he didn't have enough talent to choose from, but, um, I, don't know I think that's that part of the problem, David, actually, because looking at this now, I mean, we're, we're already beginning. It's also one of Trump's mistakes was transition planning began way too late. So we're already I've got a guy in charge who's already putting together our plans for what the staffing would look like. And this is one area where the bench is light. I mean, Baker and yeah. Kennan. I mean, these guys are dead. Right. And so. Yeah, exactly. Well, but those are the right types of people. I mean, George Kennan was a genius. He was the architect of our Cold War containment policy. He also was against us getting involved in the Vietnam War. He said so in advance. He testified before Congress. And in the late 90s, one of the last interviews he did, he talked about what a huge mistake we were making with NATO expansion, that it was going to mm-hmm. undo his life's work, that we had a we had won the Cold War, we had a peaceful situation with the Russians, but bringing NATO up to its border was going to result in new antagonism, and it was going to unwind everything. And, and he used the word uh, tragic mistake. So he kind of foresaw everything, you know, for decades. And, um, you know, James Baker similarly was very competent. It, it does seem like we have a dearth of those highly competent diplomatic figures who know how to negotiate um, peaceful arrangements. It just seems like the people we have now just rattle the saber and, you know, yeah. are, are crusaders looking for new wars to get us into. Maybe we need yeah. some venture capitalists in there. <laughs> who actually understand how to do deals. Yeah, I, I, I think also just like the public doesn't appreciate it fully that, that I, like the, the U.S. State Department is quite belligerent. It's really like, yes, yes. You know, well, they the, just promoted Victoria Newland to number two after. Are you Lincoln. serious? Yeah. Who she is literally yeah, responsible for much of what's going on in Ukraine today. Right. With she's her, the she's the, she's the head of the snake. Situation. She's the head of the snake on this. Absolutely. I mean, she's a total warmonger. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's insane. Uh, this, the, the State Department's supposed to be the, the place of the diplomats, not the warmongers. Um, and, and, but we're actually in this ironic situation where the, where the warriors want peace, the Pentagon wants peace, um, and, and the diplomats want war, um, which, by the way, also happened in, in Dr. Strangelove. Um, so, um, you know, and, and, and we, we just need to tell our damn State Department to stop this bullshit. Um, and because and, and, they're not informing the public. They're, like, taking actions on behalf of the American public. But I don't think the public's aware of this, you know? So um, we're going to make them aware <laughs> is the answer. It's the only solution. Yeah, it's like, like we're, we're interfering in all these other, other countries and, um, you know, it, and, 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 and putting a lot of sort of, U.S. resources against it, and I think also creating a lot of um, resentment against America. Yes. Um, so, you know, because, you know, if, 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 if there's some, you know, if we're like, we're like, like a, sort of a giant, we're like a somewhat of an ogre, you know, economically, 
And so it's easy for us to accidentally step on, or, you know, or bump into small countries, not really re realize it. Um, mm -hmm. And so then we're like if, d doing bad things and, and, and um, people are dying and, <laughs> and we're generating bad blood. And this is all happening without the knowledge of the public. Yeah, just waddling in, sloppily waddling in and then, and then making a mess. In a clumsy way. Now, I think yeah, the and not even succeeding. That's what, like, and not even know, succeeding. Yeah, it's, it's one like, thing if you were good at it. <laughs> yeah, it's like it, even still, failing. I'd be against it. But it'd be one thing if you were good at it. At least yeah, there I'm would like, be a tougher argument. And yet, yes, here I'm, we like, are. I'm like, how how has regime change gone? Uh, let's see. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. Well, Cuba. Fidel Castro outlived all American presidents. <laughs> right. <laughs> that tried to assassinate him. Um, Which, the, the, by the way, let's say the quiet part out loud. I do think that that is the latent impetus in Russia here. I mean, when you when you sort of get to the heart of the intuition, right? What are we actually solving for? It's you know we don't we don't it's a bit of a bad word. It's like ESG. They don't say ESG anymore. They make up some new words for it. It's like we don't say sure. regime change anymore. But functionally, that's that's what we're playing for in Russia. We will not stop until we're done. And I think it's a shame and it's a lesson we it's haven't like, learned. It's it, it, it's, it's very foolish because anyone, anyone who is going to take out Putin is not going to be some peacenik. They're probably a, they're a, a, even more hardcore than Putin because they killed mm -hmm. him. Okay. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And, and, and either way, so, I mean, does that mean I trust Putin? No, I do not trust Putin, but I trust him to follow his self-interest and he can trust us to follow ours, which is why I also want us to abandon this thing where we selectively invoke the fact that we're somehow protecting democracy around the world, when in fact, you know, if I'm in the position to lead, here's what I'm going to say is my job, and I'll say it internally, but I'll say it externally too, is I'm in this to advance America's interests. And so now you know you can trust me because that's what how I'm going to make my decisions. Sure. And I expect that you are going to advance Russia's interests or you are going to advance Poland's interests. And then we can all have a deal, whatever that deal may be, to be able to make sure each person gets something out of the trade. That's how good deals work. Everyone has to emerge well, with something they didn't have going in. And we can be more honest about it rather than dowsing it in this moral veneer, which is otherwise so hypocritical that we you know, immediately get called out on it because it was obviously false in the first place. Well, how, how about an executive order that prohibits the U.S. from being involved in regime change operations? Period. End of story. I mean, this whole conflict in Ukraine basically started in 2014 with a coup the, you know the maidan yep. coup against the democratically elected leader of the country with the backing of the united states now the extent of our backing is in dispute and people debate it but i don't think there's any question that the u.s did back it and our involvement at a minimum taints it if it was a if it was a legitimate expression of the will of the people of ukraine we should have just let it happen without our involvement whatsoever Oh, there's no question everyone... about it. I mean, they were kind about that, David. There's no question about it. Listen to the leaked tapes of Newland, right? Those were right. The, the very person we were just talking about a moment ago in our right. role in picking Ukraine's next leader. She didn't know those were, you know, being taped calls, but now we understand that we were absolutely driving that. So, yes. yeah. you know, all that said, I'm, I, I can be cheerful about this if we learn the lesson and we behave differently going forward as a consequence. But I do not think suppressing the information and tricking the public to fail to learn that lesson is going to be the right answer for us. No, exactly. Um, and I can think of like, so on the Ukraine front, I larger concern should just be when all said and done, like, you know, where the, where are the boundaries going to be and, and how many people died? And I think we should just, just think, think hard about that and, and, um, and, and not sacrifice the flower of Ukrainian Ruth. It, to not, not sacrifice the flower of Ukrainian youth in trenches to achieve nothing, which is currently what we're pushing them to do. And that's insane. Um, so and that, that needs to stop. Yeah. yeah. I'm into it. Sax, you want to take one or two more? Uh, I, yeah, I'm having too much fun, time. but it's yeah, yeah I'll take, I, I can take a couple more. I'm having too much fun, but unfortunately I got to, you know, okay. I, I could talk to you guys all day, but I'm, but you know, got to roll pretty soon. All right, uh, ALX, you you have a question? Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that uh, if you became president, that you would release like a similar style Twitter files or Facebook files type thing, but you'd do it for um, all companies that the government has interacted with and sort of tried to pressure. How would that? Uh, how would that look like? 
Yeah. So basically, a lot of what I think is happening today is the government is deputizing private companies to do through the back door what the government couldn't directly do through the front door. Right. So Elon releasing the Twitter files confirmed what I, you know, on the page of the Wall Street Journal a couple of years ago surmised and everyone dismissed as a conspiracy theory that absolutely this was happening and at a scale unimaginable with social media companies. You responding to government threats and in some cases inducements, carrots and sticks, to censor speech that the government could not censor directly. I mean, even down to individuals like, by name, Alex Berenson. Why didn't you shut down his Twitter account? This individual in a meeting in the White House. Mm-hmm. Well, sure. it, 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 it's just, it's just, this is, if the First Amendment was created to do one thing, like literally there's just one thing the First Amendment exists for, it is to protect people to be able to criticize the government and its policies. That's what this guy's high crime was, is he criticized government policies on COVID-19. And then the government is saying, no, this guy needs to be shut down. How could you possibly? And with an implicit threat of regulation over Twitter, if they Twitter didn't follow through. And so the pre-Elon Twitter you know, managerial class did indeed follow through on the threat. And then they get an attaboy on the back from the government. So that's one example. But it's not just limited to social media. I think this is pervasive across the U.S. economy, actually. I think it's much of what's going on, say, with John Kerry in his role as the climate czar. He's somebody who they could not pass the Green New Deal through Congress. And so he has boasted about meeting with the banking CEOs of this country, the CEOs of most major banks, getting them to sign a pledge, a sort of climate pledge to join a North American net zero alliance. I'll remind you that banks are not charitable institutions, right? This is a two-way relationship. So what are they getting in return? for signing that pledge. Again, it's a backdoor way of getting done what the politically accountable class, people we elect in Congress, would have never been able to do through the front door. Even Joe Manchin would not have stood by and let them do it. And so what I've said is that if you're a federal employee, so, so I'm, a, I'm a state action doctrine guy, which is if, if it's state action in disguise, then I think the Constitution still applies, which means that the government can't use a puppet in the private sector to get done its dirty work. It's bound by the same constraints as the federal government, so we should know about it. So what I would say is that on pain of criminal penalties, any evidence of a documented evidence of a government employee who has pressured a private actor to achieve a goal that the government couldn't have achieved itself, we just have a sunshine law applied to it. Let the public see it. Roll that log over. Let's see what crawls out. And, and, and that's it for that particular provision, right? I mean, I have a lot of different views on rescinding a lot of unconstitutional federal regulations and reorganizing the federal government. But on this one, it's that simple. And I think that the first step of restoring truth, back to that principle, we can handle the truth. Just tell us. Tell us what the truth is. We can deal with it. We can process it. We can handle it. But let's at least see how deep that rot runs. And the fact that I'm sitting here as a private citizen observing small examples of it bubbling up to the surface, it's like a broken windows theory, which is to say, if you see a broken window, it means that there's something else wrong in the neighborhood. That's what I think is going on. And so hopefully that, that addresses your question. That's doable. It's easy. It's what you would expect and hope for of a chief executive who's in charge of the executive branch of the government. And that's an easy thing to at least be able to deliver on to help rebuild public trust, which is, I think, something we've been badly lacking. And so whether it's whether it's UFOs, whether it's the Jeffrey Epstein client lists, whether it is the effectiveness of vaccines, whether it's what we just talked about, my view is we can handle the truth, trust the public with it. And then that's going to actually ironically rebuild trust in institutions that the public has otherwise now long correctly lost. Hey, Vivek. It's awesome. Um, Thank you. Given the problems with the last election cycle, um, we had the election infrastructure problems. Take one last one, David, and then we'll we'll wrap. Can Vivek hear me? Yeah, Yeah, I'd love to go uh, to ask a question. uh, Well, we have have Ian Ian and Nuance, bro. How about about, Maybe we'll take them together. We'll We'll take them together. Eric and go first. We'll take them together. Is that possible? Oh, come on. (laughs) That's awesome. So, um, so, so Vivek, obviously there were problems with election infrastructure during the last election cycle, but I think one of the nuance. Oh, Ian? I, I don't think nuance. You go think, first, uh, and then Ian. Oh, that's I don't it, think, David. Uh, you can hear nuance. Yeah, so I'll just yeah I don't think question. Vivek can hear me. So, 
Yeah. So, hey, Elon, uh, David, Vivek, great conversation. Thanks for having me up. I think the uh, audience is really enjoying this whole back and forth. It's a, I feel it's a real breath of fresh air to have such an open conversation on X spaces. So my question for you, and this, uh, you know, ties back to one of our conversations that we had on uh, Mario Space, right? Uh, you mentioned that, you know, if you were elected, you'd want for American businesses to be banned from doing business in China. Now, you didn't really elaborate on that. And so my question is how, you know, that work for companies like Apple, or even Tesla, which, you know, operate over there. In my opinion, it makes sense for large American companies to hit the world's largest market. But crucially, can you clarify your policy on American businesses in China? How would you deal with that? Sure. And and I want to actually, I, I want to be clear. I actually think that the best state of the world would be everybody playing by the same set of rules in an economy where just like I think we're going to be – your Western Europe and Russia are going to be better off by opening economic relations through the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. That's what I want to see here as well. But we've got to make sure that everybody's actually playing by the same set of rules. And to me, it's very important that no more forced IP transfers, no more forced data transfers, no more forced you know, effectively service of non-economic nature, turning companies into lobbying pawns. You know, effectively having a nice little condition to be able to get a domestic license to do business if you're BlackRock selling mutual funds in China to make sure that you don't apply the same standards to Chinese companies as you apply to American ones. That's what I basically stand for is level playing field. That's what we need. And I think that that doesn't exist. I think that most people acknowledge that. I think that that's not going to happen automatically. That's going to require, by the way, a policy that I think is also really important that goes straight along with it is re-entering the Pacific trade relationships around the rest of the rim of the Pacific, the CPTPP. I think we should re-enter it. I think this is a little bit different than what, you know, the, the course of action taken by Trump and exiting the TPP. I think that was actually maybe, maybe a poor one decision. Maybe more sense for the people over here, right? Because I think uh, Trump canceled it because, first of all, it wasn't fair to Americans, right? It really yep. wasn't. But also exactly. wasn't fair to people over here. It was, it was beneficial to corporations, but not to the, you know, local farmers, you know, your mom and pop stores, who and would have completely been obliterated by the TPP. So maybe a, a fair version of that would make a exactly. lot of sense. Exactly. And, and I think that, I think that this, I'm a silver lining guy. I think that I can use the leverage of the fact that we did exit it to be able to say, all right, here's what we need done differently in a number of the countries from Japan on down to be able to say, here's how we reenter that on fairer terms. And so that's what I'd like to see. And I think that's one of the things early on, actually, even in relation, forgetting about where we get to on China, the first thing that's easiest to do is actually to reenter the rest of that Pacific trade relationship, including the other members of the CPTPP. That puts us in then a strong position from a trade perspective to then take a look at where we stand vis-a-vis -vis China. So I, I could go on for hours on this one and, and uh, you know, we could, but I want to, we'll take one last question from like the other guy and then we'll wrap. Have. Yeah, I'd love yes, to sir. grill you on China, you know, because you mentioned once that you were banned I appreciate from it, man. China. And that's a concern of mine because, you know, I criticize them quite a bit and I'm always worried about, you know, uh, traveling through Hong Kong. I mean, have they given you a reason well, hey, why they banned hey, you? Hey, just, in the, in, just in the interest of time, um, I just want to make sure we can get to uh, the last question here. I know oh, yeah. I've been waiting for yeah, a no, while. Yeah, no, that was so. the last question. That was literally so, my yeah. last question. Yeah, cool, awesome. Yeah. Okay, appreciate uh, Vivek, it. Vivek, you can um, hear me now, right? Awesome, yes. Cool. How you doing, man? Awesome. Um, so election infrastructure was obviously like a big issue in the last election cycle. But I think even more so uh, is election just funding for candidates. Right. So the left was out raising the right pretty significantly in a lot of races. Um, what do you plan to do in the upcoming election, both in the primary and the general, if you are nominated? Uh, you know, so you can outraise people like Soros, who in the last election cycle, I mean, 170 million, he was the top person out of any individual and then in, including on top of the 170 million 140 million and other things uh, another 60 million his not even getting into open society foundations that did about a billion dollars uh during that time uh do you think the richest man in the world should get involved to maybe uh you know <laughs> take over soros <laughs> in that position i don't know if elon has any thoughts about that but what are your thoughts on that how are you gonna you know beat the left at their own game well so, I would, uh that's that's. Oh, sorry, I'm not going to speak on behalf of Elon. <laughs> Elon, you want to go first? <laughs> uh, well, sure. sure. Uh, and um, you know, I think this is an important discussion. And, and Vivek, I think you're winning over a lot of people. I should say, I think, with your position, because I think, you know, w what I've heard you say uh, makes makes ton of sense. Uh, like, I, you know, I, I like, I think, I think this, I think you're winning over a lot of people actually in, in this in this uh, this conversation. Thank um, you. Thank you. 
So, um, you know, uh, yeah, so but my apologies. I, I actually lost track of <laughs> No, I mean, he was just asking about the influence of money in politics. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the sort of – there are a bunch of things which have these, these uh, misnomers of like – that sound like they're pro-democracy, but they're actually – basically ballot harvesting um and th- there is like this crazy this, this sort of hack that uh you know i mean george Soros is really an, an like an incredibly talented uh, arbitrager and he's uh you know he's that applied that talent monetarily and politically um and so uh he's you know he figured out that oh through uh charitable organizations uh you can you can promote causes with pre-tax money um and uh and that doesn't count in any of the political stuff so it's actually extremely effective. You don't actually attack the candidate; you just attack their posi- the positions that they hold, um, and then uh, and then you, you you sort of hire a big team to go and like harvest ballots from like nursing homes and all that sort of stuff. These are real things that have happened, um, uh, and so you know there's you know what like I, I don't I don't think we should like the, you know counter corruption with corruption, um, but. Mm-hmm. But but I you know I think I think we do need to uh, the, there does need to be like a get out the vote campaign and a you know uh, yeah um, yeah I mean, I mean it's, 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 certainly Republicans need to work harder um, at, at at winning at winning winning over voters um, and, and especially in, in the, the, the the key sort of Senate races and, and House races and, and presidency uh, but it's it's um, you know. Uh, you know, and I appreciate you saying that, Elon. And for me, you know, the real distinction isn't even between Republicans and Democrats. If we're pro-American, we stand for the same, stand for the principles this nation was founded on. The way I look at it is we're on the same team. And for me in this journey, this is, I think, part of why I came into this as an outsider. I think it will take some measure of people who didn't grow up in professional politics to change that game. This country has blessed me with much, right? And so I've lived like so many of you on this call, live the full American dream. And I have so far, before I wanted to ask anybody else to invest money in this campaign, wanted to invest my own first. And so I've put in over $15 million of my hard earned money already, precisely because I did not want to take a tin can asking a bunch of other people for permission to run. And then that does come with expectations. And the funny thing is, you know, even in the Democrat party, many people on a principled basis used to say, keep mega money out of politics. You don't hear that anymore. And that does come with certain ties and expectations that I do think corrupt the way our democratic process works. That being said, yeah. you know, a guy like me, if I want to succeed, has to be able to compete. It's an old well, saying yeah. in tennis, you know, you got to you either win or you leave blood on the court. And I don't want to leave blood on the court. I want to win. And, you know, if, if, if you guys, you know, I think, I mean, this is just a little bit self-interested plug, to be honest with you, but just to be totally transparent as well. You know, other candidates have mega super PACs that have ads on television. We're a third in the Republican primary. We haven't bought TV ads, but it's going to be whoever wins this election. It's going to be about two billion dollars that gets spent in order to do it. But, but and so fact, that, was, that was my question. That's sort of the gist. How are you, yep. you going to do it? That was basically my question. So, so here's so, so 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 I hope we do it. But the way I, here's how I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it by turning into somebody's puppet. I'd rather lose this election than to than to you know, bow down to, I think, a lot of the special interests that have broken the system. That being said, here's how we're doing it so far. We got 70,000 small dollar donors in the first few months of this campaign. I'm literally an outside. I've never had a donor or donor list in my life. And 40,000 was the threshold for reaching the first Republican debate by August. Sitting in early July, we're at 70,000. And so 40% of them are first time ever donors to the Republican Party. Normally, that number is 2%, actually. And so, you know, give a lot of business-minded folks on this call, I'll give you kind of a metric. You want to know how to predict an election. I'll give you, I'm going to give you the best metric to prediction, predict an election result, and Trump proved it in 2015. It's not the current polls, right? I mean, people look at the polls, and I'm grateful in the recent versions of them. I'm doing okay. I'm doing well. But that's not what matters. Look at how much dollars are being spent per unit in the polls, so, so for every percentage point in the polls, look at how many ad dollars are being spent for that percentage point. 
for, for most candidates in the 2015 election, Jeb Bush, yeah, you want to talk about Scott Walker, Chris Christie back then, millions of dollars per percentage point in the polls. For Donald Trump back then, it was thousands, three orders of magnitude lower. And in this race, we're seeing the same thing. There's the other candidates in the Republican field, millions of dollars in ad buys per percentage point in the polls, in my case right now, is literally in the thousands. And so what do we say there? The message is lifting us up. Now the bet is we hope that if you build it, they will come. But that's where I need people. And so the, the maximum anybody else can give to the campaign directly is six to six hundred bucks. And if somebody wants to go to Vivek2024.com right now and do it, we would appreciate it. But there's all kinds of, you know, I mean, there's, there's the game is so complicated. There's all kinds of other organizations that get that spend money supporting candidates. And my model is, you know, we, we will build it, which is to say, deliver a clear message that is honest, that is transparent, that trusts the public, believes the public can handle the truth, that wants to restore the 1776 principles that made this country great without apologizing for it, do it earnestly, do it sincerely and bet that the system works as it's supposed to. And you know, at least gratefully, I'm able to put in, you know, I mean, I don't have billions of dollars to put in, but short of that, what I do have will stop at nothing, which gives us a good advantage to start. But it's going to take a lot of really everybody, whether it's a dollar or whether it's people putting in massive amounts of money to actually lift this across the finish line. And so I'm hoping for a, a, a chance to introduce myself to the country on the debate stage starting in a few weeks. I think that's going to be critical in this race. I'm going to continue to use, frankly, forums like this one. I mean, this is great. <laughs> Think about it. There's no separate media intermediating our messages, right? Exactly. There's nothing, nothing pre-filtered. A guy <laughs> like me couldn't compete, Elon, if it weren't for modern media like this. And so <laughs> here's no, to I hoping mean, that that changes the game. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it says something like you can, you can actually, uh, you know, you're quick on your feet and you can, you can handle a, a, a rapid fire conversation on difficult subjects. Um, it's that, I mean, that, you know, couldn't be said for everyone. Um, and, and, uh, and you actually speak, you know, you speak with conviction and, and, and you're not just, you know, playing the old, same old political tapes and, uh, that everyone's and the tropes that everyone's heard a million times and, and are obviously unconvincing. Um, so I think that actually this is, uh, you know, you know, I, I certainly have a high opinion of you after this 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 conversation and, and I, I suspect a lot of people other people do too i appreciate that man and and you know i think i'll just say this in closing because i hope it's good for our country and you know you and i or anybody else on this call we're not going to agree on a hundred percent of things and that's okay right yeah you know, yeah and that, you know you and i will i mean me and sax don't agree on a hundred percent of things and and you know you and sax don't agree on a hundred percent of things and so for every other combination of people on this call but you know, if, let's say you agree with me most of the time, but you yeah. at least know I'm telling you what I believe 100 percent of the time. That's that's the best you can ask of an elected leader. And I'll at least give you that. And that's going to be hopefully something that attracts enough support. Yes. To allow me to serve as the next president of this country and, you know, lead a lead a national revival, leave an office in January 2033. My kids will be in high school. Maybe we'll move on to maybe we'll be going to Mars by then. But, you know, in the meantime, we'll see if we can revive this country. And and I'm optimistic that we can. Well, it's rare, it's, it's rare, it's, it's rare to meet the politicians that, that that's not an NPC. And so uh, I would uh, <laughs> please take that as a high compliment. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it, brother. Thank you. Thank All you. right. Well, thank you both for, for being so generous with your time. We almost went for two hours here. I think it was only scheduled to be an hour and we just, you know, time went flying by. So thank you, Elon. Thank you, Vivek. And thanks everyone for joining. See you I next. appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks David. Bye. Bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.